It's because of verses like these that Jewish scholars like Daniel Boyerin have said, Jews in general did not entertain, did entertain a logos and so were implicitly binitarian in their theology. It is only the rabbis, it is only the rabbis in response to Christianity who begin to make such opinions heretical. So Judaism never posited that there would be God come to form in physical form, come to earth in physical form, and okay. then you know acting out in the world in in that way. Judaism posits that God is beyond space and time. Occasionally, he intervenes in history, but he doesn't take physical form. It's one of the key beliefs of Judaism, actually, is an right. incorporeal God. Uh, so that means that it's it's a the the idea is is actually foreign to Judaism of of a merged God man uh, who then is who is God in physical form, but then dies and is resurrected and all this. this is, it's, a, it's just a different idea than exists in Judaism. So can God come into the world? The answer is yes, many times over. Genesis 3, 8, for example, they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the, in the cool of the day. So God comes and walks in the garden. Genesis 32, 28 through 30. Uh, he says, it says, you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And Jacob responds, verse 30, I have seen God face to face and my life has been preserved. So even he's shocked. I saw God and I'm still alive. Check that out. That's what Jacob says. He sees God. In Exodus 3, verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. So God calls out from this burning bush. Uh, interestingly, Nachmanides, uh, who is a Jewish rabbi, has said that when uh, that God can mit geshem, he can incarnate, and when uh, God was speaking out of the burning bush, that was indeed God. The Jews saw it that way too, that this is indeed God. Let's keep going a little bit further. Exodus 13, 21, the Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud, in a pillar of cloud, by day to lead them on the way, and in a pillar of fire to lead them by night to give them light. Exodus 24, how much clearer can we get? They saw the God of Israel, and under his feet there appeared a pavement. Or right, so I have, I have actual beliefs that run counter to the idea of God taking physical form as a human being, because I think that that leads to a lot of weird, yeah. weird side effects. <laughs> so Jews believe that, that God does not and cannot take human form. He does not incarnate that way. And then we start seeing this. This is fascinating. I want you to watch this very carefully. In Genesis chapter 18, it says that Yahweh appeared to Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre near Sodom and Gomorrah. Yahweh appeared. So this is another one of those examples where God appears as a man. Then in verse 1924, look at this. It says, now here's Yahweh about to rain fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. It says, Yahweh reigned on Sodom and Gomorrah from Yahweh out of heaven. Think about this. Yahweh, who's appeared as a man, is raining fire from Yahweh in heaven. And the Hebrew here actually says Yahweh twice. This isn't a bad translation of the Hebrew. What does this mean? Well, we know the Jews only believe in one God. How can Yahweh be there and here? Now, is this just Nabil's interpretation of the Old Testament? Is this just a weird thing I'm doing with the text? Look at Amos chapter 4, verse 11. I overthrew you as Elohim overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, declares Yahweh. Even the Old Testament realizes that Yahweh declares that Yahweh overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. There are two, but we know there's only one God. Uh, we, Jews also don't believe that the Messiah is a God figure. They don't believe that it's God descending to earth to die for the sins of other people. Uh, they believe that, that the Messiah is an, a political figure. Maimonides talks about certain things that the Messiah is going to have to do, including the rebuilding of the Third Temple, including the recreation of the, of the Davidic monarchy. Uh, these are things that, that Jews believe the Messiah does, but nowhere in there is there a definition of Messiah as God figure. That is, that is a late... That's Christian invention. It's, it's not inherent in Jewish belief. Take a look at Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. In that context, sitting at the hand, right hand of God is like ruling the universe with God. And it says, the Lord said to my Lord. Once again, we see that there's almost as if there are two gods, but we know there's only one God. The Old Testament is very clear about that. This is one that I definitely want you to grasp. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. Daniel sees the Ancient of Days, who is the Father, God. He sees God, and then he says in verse 13, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came even to the Ancient of Days and was brought near before him. Okay, so here's the Ancient of Days, and there's one who looks like a son of man, 
coming on the clouds of heaven. Deuteronomy 33 tells us only Yahweh comes on the clouds. But here's Son of Man coming on the clouds. So already we should be thinking, wait a minute, these are two God figures. And then verse 14 says this, And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. Wait a minute. To the Son of Man is given glory over heaven? That's what it says. And it says the people of every nation and language will serve him. This word serve is used over 130 times in the Bible. Every time it's used is used to denote a service due to God alone. And here it's being given to one who looks like a son of man. So it looks like once again we have God the Father and we have this other kind of divine being who's called one who looks like a son of man. The Jewish version of the Messiah does not match up with the Christian version of the Messiah. Jesus as the Messiah is a different figure than anything that exists inside Judaism. So when people say that the, the Judaism predicts the, the coming of Christ, uh, the, the change in the nature of what Christ is, what a Messiah would be, is different from Judaism to Christianity. Here's the point I want to make to you. The earliest Christian records proclaim that that Yahweh came into this earth. It's something he has done before, and he's going to do it. We're promised he will do it in Isaiah 9, 6. This is what Mark's gospel has to say about Jesus. Mark 1, verse 3. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Now Isaiah is saying Jesus is coming, prepare the way of the Lord. Look in Isaiah 40, verse 3. Clear the way for Yahweh in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Mark takes the word Yahweh and puts Jesus in that very same context. He's equating Jesus to Yahweh. Mark 2, 28 says the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Well, the Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments. When Jesus says he's Lord of the Sabbath, he's saying he's Lord of the Ten Commandments. Once again, Mark is giving Jesus a prerogative of Yahweh alone. In Mark 4, 38, the disciples were on a boat caught in a storm, and they called out to Jesus in their trouble, and he delivered them and made the storm to be still. Look at Psalm 107. God's people are on a boat, caught in a storm, and they called out to Yahweh in their trouble, and he delivered them and made the storm to be still. Mark is taking Yahweh out and putting Jesus in. In Mark 14, 62, when Jesus is asked who he is, he gives a trifold response. We're going to focus on the second parts. He says, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. What does this remind you of? The two verses from the Old Testament where it looked like there are two divine figures. The one sitting at the right hand of the power, co-ruler over the universe, and the one coming on the clouds of heaven who comes only as God would come, is given only the divine prerogatives of God, and served worship by all people for all time. Jesus says, you remember those passages which had two Yahwehs? One of them is me. And this is why they picked up, or they said, crucify him, because he was claiming to be God. Look, this isn't just found in Mark's gospel. Here's the other point that I want to make to Dr. Shabir Ali. Every single earliest record we have in the New Testament portrays Jesus as Yahweh. The Carmen Christi of Philippians 2 is one of the earliest records we have of Christian history. It's an insight into the time before the New Testament was written, right after Jesus was resurrected. What does it do? In verses 10 and 11, it says, to Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Where do they get that from? Isaiah 45, where it says, to Yahweh, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Even before Mark's gospel, people are taking Yahweh's name and putting it in with Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 8, 6, we see Paul, and and, and sorry, this is actually pre-Pauline, as Bart Ehrman would argue, he does argue in his new book. The earliest, even before Paul, even before Mark, Christians took the Shema, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, took that and divided that up between two, the Father and the Son, and that's what 1 Corinthians 8, 6 is. Now, it's possible, I mean, I've I've read all the, the messianic arguments about where this is foreshadowed in the book of Isaiah and all that, Jews obviously interpret those passages differently. So the argument typically made to Jews by Christians on this is that Jews are, it's forecast by the Bible. Right. Um, and right. that's, and for Jews, we, we have a whole different read when you read the Hebrew about why this may or may not be true. But Christians claim the Old Testament predicts it's going to come, so right. you disagree. Well, I, I disagree because, I mean, I think a lot, of the, a lot of these verses that are cited are actually misreads of the Hebrews. We have Jewish scholars today who say that Jews at the time of Jesus were binitarian. You refer to Daniel 7.13 and Mark's uh, statement uh, where Jesus uh, seems to make the claim that he is uh, that uh, apparently divine figure. 
But do you realize that in Daniel 17, uh, Daniel 7 rather, that this son of man that is spoken of there is not the ancient of days. This is the one who approaches the ancient of days. So you have here a divine figure, but not necessarily God. And in fact, not God, because God has to be the ancient of days. So aren't you doing the same equivocation thing where you're looking at my time up? Okay. Dr. I love talking about the Son of Man. Um, this is my favorite thing. I want you guys to get this. I want everyone to understand this. It's not that when Jesus calls himself the Son of God, he's talking about being divine, and when he talks about the Son of Man, that's when he talks about being human. Wrong. It's actually this verse, Daniel 7, 13. Yes, you do have the Ancient of Days sitting on his throne, and then you have one who has all the prerogatives of God, is described as coming in as God. He receives worship that only God can receive. And this is why we say that, okay, you have two different persons who are both God, found in Daniel 7, 13, and 14. It's because of verses like these that Jewish scholars like Daniel Boyerin have said, Jews in general did not entertain, did entertain a logos and so were implicitly binitarian in their theology. It is only the rabbis... It is only the rabbis in response to Christianity who begin to make such opinions heretical. So even the Jews, according to a Jewish scholar, Daniel Boyer, and even the Jews saw this as two, yet one. That's why they were binitarian at the time of Jesus. Alan Siegel, in this book, uh, says that... Jews at that time were binitarian, and he says it's apt to call them binitarian if you look at page 150. They were binitarian because of verses like this, where you have two in one. It was their exegesis, not their philosophy, not some sort of evolution which led them to believe that God is plural in his nature. 